are here know a lot of this stuff. Uh, this is maybe an overview and uh, some intro. An intro maybe not needed, but uh, we'll see if you get bored. Uh, so I'll go through the uh, intro. Well, maybe intro will be this. What is deep learning? But uh, first is uh, so what? Uh, like we can we can use brain imaging uh, to detect diseases, and that's that's the goal, right? We want to inform doctors and scientists about any problems in the brain. Uh, that that's why we create better and better tools, and uh, physicists and engineers help us with tools creation and usual response to the challenges of the modern times is creation of tools that collect better and better resolution data, so more, more, more data. And when you get a lot of data, it's very hard to see what's happening uh, be, uh, because initially when we measure data, we would just plot a uh, one-dimensional plot, analyze it, and understand what's going on. But with multi-dimensional data, multivariate data, Without computers, we're hopeless. Uh, but uh, with the amounts of data that we're collecting right now, we're uh, just can't do it. Like it's very hard, even with our existing methods, to understand what's going on uh, with the data. And so, uh, the dream is: what if we had someone, someone do that for us, uh, like undergraduates uh, or a robot? Or um, yeah, or some some kind of a method um, that would just go through the data and tell us what's important, what's interesting, and uh, make predictions about the data. But mostly, what's important in the data, right? So the, uh, and uh, the learning enters uh, with this question in mind: when you have a lot of data and it's hard to manually or it's hard hard to in advance say what are the important features, what are the important parts. Uh, then, uh, as I will show later, deep learning works because, if, in fact, if we knew what are the important features in uh, every data set that we get and every type of data that we would analyze, existing methods or methods rather than deep learning work <coughs> quite well. Say, uh, support vector machines with per perfect features would work very well on multiple tasks that deep learning is working well right now. But the problem is we don't know what the perfect, perfect features are or what the features are. So, the, uh, okay, there was a picture here, but it's not going to work. Let me actually let me correct those things because if there is more of those, that's a problem. So uh, why deep learning is called deep learning? What's uh, wh why is that word deep in there? So if you recall the previous talks or all of your work uh, for people who are here, uh, this is a model of many methods that we use. Say if you think about PCA, this is a model of PCA. Those are the latent variables, and this is the data, and those are the, the weights, the linear transformation between the latent variables and the data. If you think about ICA, this is the model for uh, ICA as well. So latent factor model, that, that's what we used to use. It, it's any factor, matrix factorization model or any model that can be represented as a matrix factorization is this one level model uh, that uh, deep learning world calls it. So if we take this module and treat it as a module, as a building block, as a constructing block, and start stacking them, building a model that is deeper than this model. That that's that's what uh, we call deep learning. There, there are uh, models like deep elite network or like feed forward neural network, which look exactly like that. And the data enters at, at one end and say uh, the 
result magically appears at the other end. But there are also infinitely, so-called infinitely deep models, uh, which are recurrent neural networks. When this input kind of goes back to the out, or the output goes back to the input, then you can indefinitely expand it into into a long uh, model. But the depth comes from there, from the stacking game that you put one model on another. So if you observe, if this model is a linear model, linear transformation, so what will happen if we just stack linear transformations one on top of another? Yeah, it will be like all of this will be still one linear transformation, one matrix. So in order for deep learning to have bigger, uh, some larger power than traditional methods, transformation here in the layers has to be non linear. So each layer here, uh, each hidden layer, has activation function. And activation function is a slight nonlinearity, like uh, more, uh, most most often it's sigmoid function that caps the uh, <coughs> magnitude of the input uh, of the you know, uh, extremes. So then, um, uh, just a little. Uh, so deep learning in uh, comes from it's a new name for an old thing. Neural networks were invented, invented in the 60s, in the 70s, and then in the 80s, 80s there was a lot of advances when uh, backpropagation was finally became, finally became mainstream. But and people already started talking about <coughs> deeper models. But uh, with uh, back then, in uh, 92, I believe uh, there was an explanation of uh, so so people found that deeper models don't work; they just don't train. There is no, uh, like, you keep training, nothing nothing happens, the model doesn't improve. And uh, Hochreiter and Schmidhuber, then sh they showed uh, why that's happening, and they call this problem a problem of vanishing gradients. Basically, when you when you start with a randomly initialized model and try to do stochastic gradient descent, you only keep modifying uh, top layers of the network uh, right, right here. And the gradient doesn't doesn't propagate back through to affect uh, this thing. So in 2006, uh, uh, Hinton and Salvatino and others they discovered that you can do a trick with. Uh, and I'll be switching back and forth. You can do a trick with this model. You can pre-train. Uh, you can pre-initialize those weights smarter than random, and then your model, uh, the, your gradient. Uh, starts propagating because your model basically is already near the solution and even a weak signal from uh, the gradient. So the ranking rank is a precision problem, right? Not, not a theoretical problem. <laughs> so if we don't keep we have an infinite precision like a new one, a subcategory. Infinite precision and infinite time and in, in infinite computation. If you can wait infinitely long and infinite precision, then yes, it's not just it's precision. also using time. Well, because oh, it's exponential. yeah, because it's yeah. falling down exponential and like a very very weak signal with infinite precision will get there. That but then you need to just wait for a long time. Yeah. Well, in fact, I'm uh, maybe exaggerating the problem because at Google they actually took the old school feed forward neural networks, lots of data, lots of computation, and it worked. Without without any pre-training, without any new like uh, tricks, basically. Is that because the computer has better? Because no, no, like the, the signal that propagated was enough, and the amount of data was in, like was enough for them to run through multiple times and not overfeed. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, yeah. Anyways, the problem is, is there for original networks. And here, here's just a diagram of uh, pre-training pre and fine-tuning cycle of a deeper model. You can start with a shallow model. That could be even ICA or anything in this case, and in the original papers in 2006, it was a restricted Boltzmann machine. You take raw data, you pre-train a restricted Boltzmann machine. Then you can continue training it in a discriminative fashion when you make a classifier out of this by putting uh, class class nodes, hidden nodes there. Then after the model is trained, which means that those weights here are set, then you uh, push the data through the, mo through the trained model, get this output, processed output. It's a slightly nonlinear transformation. Right? It's a 
linear transformation with uh, after afterwards a uh, slight nonlinear transformation right here. Then you could excuse me, take this data and uh, take this output and use it as a data to the next cycle, uh, pre-train level two, then make a classifier of depth two, train the classifier again. Now you have this and this way it's initialized. Push the data through, get another uh, process data set, and can keep continuing until you build your network. Yeah. Yeah, I see the bottom half is not parallelized. Yeah, RBM, it, it doesn't, this is a feed forward uh, network, yeah. and RBM is uh, not, not non directional, like non directional uh, graphical model. Can you write the path to the schedule of IBM? Well, it's initialized with RBM, yeah, but it, the, the process is not RBM anymore. Like, so you, you use RBM training only here in pre-training. And then I put RBM1 and RBM2 to relate back to where those weights came from. Yeah, but when you use fine-tuning training, it, it's just back-propagation training as feed forward network. And here, again, you only feed forward, uh, basically take uh, one subject's data, Transform it, get uh, output. Take next subject state and transform it, get output. So it's there's one to one correspondence of uh, rows, but columns don't correspond. Uh, they could be any. Uh, are you doing guys reduction of data or is just like the output? You can if if the cartoon if you treat it as a cartoon that the number of. Uh, Hidden like the number of uh, visible units and the number of hidden units is the same, then there is no reduction of data, just transformation. But it's up to you how to construct this function. This is the power and the weakness of deep learning because it's so flexible, uh, you can construct anything. Uh, but because it's so flexible, you have to find the right thing on your own. Like there is, uh, there are ways with it still. So uh, let me try this. What is my sign on your keyboard? So here's a, here's a simulator for a network, uh, just so you can relate to my previous pictures. Uh, this is written for Tensor, TensorFlow uh, library, right? So this is our data. And the two classes of the data, uh, orange class and blue class. And we want our neural network, which has inputs here, this x and y coordinates, and outputs here uh, that it, uh, we want the network to be able to distinguish those classes. So after, yeah, like here, you will see the objective function, uh, yeah, training loss. Like right now, it is uh, 0.5. It's right, well. This is the training loss, this is the test loss, yeah. And uh, yeah, let's try and see what it does. So eventually it converts and uh, like this, this is what this neuron uh, decision boundary is. And it is combined by weighted combination of those decision boundaries of these three units with different weights. and. Uh, like uh, that that's basically how the network works right you can keep adding layers and uh, let's try and get a more flexible model but basically this decision boundary of this neuron is again weighted combination of all the preceding ones and uh, those two they separate separate the classes it's just just how to just to demonstrate the power that um, imagine now multi-dimensional output in a multi-dimensional space that you need to separate. Then uh, so well actually we separate two classes here, but the the input is just two dimension. So if we have lots of inputs here, lots of dimensions, a similar decision boundary can be constructed by that function. Actually, enough to have one hidden layer. There is a theorem from the 50s uh, and uh, yeah, um, one of the Hilbert problems that non constructively proves that we can, we can represent any function with just one uh, hidden layer. 
So that's what a neural network is. Uh, the activation function, I kind of see the legacy. Uh, hyperbolic tangent in this case. Oh, I got it. We can, we can put more uh, linear functions, uh, well, rectified linear, there is zero in the negative range, and just 45 degree linear in the positive range. And then they will, they will be more like sharper, as you see. The uh, decision bounded is sharper, but the results uh, result is very good. Actually, rectified linear means uh, were one of the inventions of the new wave of deep learning. Uh, it was found that they were much better than you know they, they're fast because it's linear. It's only uh, you take a max uh, of zero and uh, the, the, the input, right? Uh, and they work quite well. And for rectified linear unit, there is even some theory because it's easier to analyze because they're partly linear. And um, some theory why, not why the network works, we, we sort of know, right? We know it, it constructs a decision boundary. But the theory was about uh, capacity. So can we in advance say what a network can separate? And it turns out that what it does, each, each linear bound right here, basically partitions the space, the input space, and it creates uh, cells. And so the more cells it can isolate, the, the more powerful it is, because then the network can uh, quote unquote reason about more things, more concepts. Okay, uh, that was a small demo, which is uh, at the ball. So now, convolutional neural network. Actually, a lot. So in 2006, that paper and little advances, although they were noticed in the machine learning community, they went uh, largely unnoticed elsewhere, despite the science paper and uh, so on and so forth. But in 2012, another old model was successfully applied to. Uh, and won a competition by reducing the error by half, which in previous years it was only reduced by fractions of percent. And that model is called convolutional neural network. And con convolution, right, uh, is, a, is a process of uh, linearly transforming the data by. Uh, <coughs> I don't know, I, it's easier to explain here than, for me at least, than to define the general convolution, what it is in simple terms. But, uh, so instead, uh, let's go back to this one. So here, in this model, we have an input, and if our input, say, is an image, then every pixel of an image, uh, although, although this one is not fully connected, but usually this hidden unit will be connected to every pixel of an image. And if, if we have uh, 256 by 256 image, then that's a 256 squared number of images and weights per hidden unit. That's a lot of parameters, and especially the, uh, as we go deeper, we get more and more of parameters uh, to estimate, which needs a lot of data and a lot of time pronto overfeeding and so on and so forth. So I, the idea with convolutional network that if we take a, a convolutional kernel and like the process of Gaussian blurring that we always use uh, eight by eight kernels in uh, the fMRI data is a, a kind of convolution. So the idea with convolutional network that we take a receptive field not, that is not equal to the whole image that is a small patch, uh, like this nine weights. For this hidden unit, there will be nine weights here. And then there's nine weights, they will be the same. And they will be convolved with the image. So scanned through in, in sequence, uh, maybe with a different stride, but usually stride one. Same principles are used in JPEG. Same principles are used in JPEG and JPEG. Uh, you mean that JPEG and others, they just chunk the image, right? In, uh, yeah, they are much more with this filter time than... Yeah. Well, yeah. they, they use Cassin transform, right? Yeah. Uh, so, but the point here is that 
So when you're doing Gaussian blurring or any other filter, you take a predefined kernel here and transform your image from one to another. In convolutional neural network, you actually learn those filters. And the trick here is that uh, now one filter covers the whole image, but you only have, say, nine parameters there to estimate because each unit, each hidden unit in the next layer is uh, has the same weights. So it's called weight tying, parameter tying. So much smaller number of parameters, that means you can easier estimate it and estimate it more robustly. So here's how a typical uh, convolutional neural network looks. It has uh, an input image, so 256 by 256. And then there is a convolutional layer here. And technically, this square here has the same parameters. Like for each pixel here, like this one, the same parameters are... Uh, uh, the same weights? Yeah, the same weights yeah. are learned. But, but for this uh, picture there, it's kind of a, another hidden unit, the same weights, <coughs> but different from this one. So you learn different receptive fields. They, those weights are now called receptive fields, and I'll show you examples. But then your output image is about, well, uh, there is a difference, but it's about the same size as your input image. And again, you have lots of parameters and lots of computation to do. So in order to kind of reduce the computation, pooling is uh, used. And pooling says, okay, let's take a small uh, patch here and just compress it into one pixel. Uh, that dimension reduces. And then after pooling, you again do another convolution uh, layer and so on and so forth. And then finally you get to the output category. And turns out because you have much, much fewer parameters there in the convolutional network than in fully connected network, it, uh, it learns much more efficiently. And actually first application was um, MNIST, zip, uh, not MNIST, zip code recognition and uh, handwritten recognition on, the, on checks for banks. And that was done back in the 90s and that worked, but uh, it couldn't do much more. In 2012, this competition called ImageNet with thousands of classes and millions of images, this network won the competition, uh, now recognizing what's on the image, not just recognizing small handwritten digits. And then the industry looked at it. So, so you're actually increasing the number of the amount of data as you compose. Reviews. How do you increase? For reviews. Uh, for each uh, set of parameters, you get a new image, <coughs> like the second layer. So each one of these two, you get multiple 256 by 256 blocks of data. So that's increasing the amount of data. Here, yeah. You, you increase. You decrease in uh, space, and then you decrease again across the uh, here. When you do convolution, you simultaneously uh, convolve all of the feature maps. Uh, and they all go together. Yeah, and they all go together. So you can keep them constant, but you still decrease the decrease the spatial extent of the image. Like here's this depth. Uh, like we see this depth. It all goes into one pixel. So it's all, uh, they, they are called channels, like what, what you're referring to, the increase, yeah, you have multiple channels. And but it's also a neighborhood on the image. It's also a neighborhood on the image. Small patch on the image across all the images. So, yeah, so but, in the first step, you were subsampling your, you are converting the image with different filters? Yeah, different filters, but unknown filters. So in this case, it will be four different filters and they, they are learned. And then, in, in again, here, well, pooling is it's just max pooling. We, we, take, we take maximum of uh, 2 by 2 squares there, uh, or 3 by 3 squares. Larger, larger max pooling is too destructive, so it's not usually used in practice. But then, again, you take as many as you need here, that each square here is a hidden unit, basically, or um, a unique feature map. And those feature maps, this is how they look in the first layer. So take the same network, take this network, and train it on the faces data. And separately train uh, the same network, but on a different data set, cars. 
And both of them, on the first layer, this first receptor field, and uh, how many are there? Four by six, right? So uh, 24 units here, they each learn an edge detector. So it's a, it's a filter, that, but it's learned filter. And if you look at the next layer, and similarly to what I showed in the example with, uh, with this live example, you can combine previous inputs, and well, you can actually project uh, a, a hidden unit in the second layer onto the input space, and the size. That's why size increases, even though the original batch was smaller. And you see that the units, hidden units in the second layer, they learn types of ice or types of uh, phase parts, and then. Uh, units in the third layer, they learn face, face types. And the same with cars, but now for cars, the same network from a different data set learn features that are important for this data set, like parts of cars and types of cars. And that is exciting, that is actually uh, like what what is good about this network is that uh, we don't need to know Specifics. We don't need to be the experts in the data. The network becomes an expert just from the data and from the output. Yeah. So we start with the body, right? The data looks the same. Yeah, because, because, because the, it, it was noticed in the 90s, uh, and even now some people like uh, Nicholas Krieger scored that they use this similarity that the structure of CNN and some of its performance. Is similar to what Visual Cortex does. That in V1 we have those edge detectors as first layer. So it's it's amazing that it's such a simple model uh, and yeah. brain yeah. visual. Yeah, yeah, they, they work similar. So what we're doing now is that if I look at the top, right? If I look at the bottom, it's actually clustered. No, no. Like so the input are faces in the left side and cars in the right side. So it's not that. My question is, the input is the bottom. No, no, no. The top the top. This is not the input. This is what was learned. So the input actually is faces on the left side, two faces. And, and so, so it was faces here, mm -hmm. where input that uh, has faces. And here, they yeah. learn edge detectors. Oh, okay. And okay. in the next layer, they learned uh, parts of faces. One network learned part of faces, the other one learned parts of cars, depending on what it was child. For the computational neural network, the way they learn the weights is like the back propagation with yeah, the back constraints and the, that they should be equal, well, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, so it's, it's yeah, a constraint. It's wait, wait time. There's no other tricks. Uh, no, it's it's just back propagation. There is not even like no mm, stochastic gradient descent works surprisingly well, uh, and that is pretty much. The only thing that is used, like different tricks to how to optimize speed up and um, automatically tune stochastic gradient descent, but no other method developed in uh, optimization theory because the models are too large, the data is too large, and so doing any batch, any like best models in optimization theory, they're batched. Like you have to put all of the data uh, there, and it's computationally infeasible. And simple thing like stochastic gradient descent. Okay, well, but here, what helps us? Well, one of one of the other one of the uh, selling points in those, in those networks also that look the network automatically extracted concepts from low level concepts to high level concepts. So neat, right? Interesting. Why don't we apply it to brain data and uh, somewhere up at the top there have, have, have a unit that has a concept of uh, schizophrenia. That'd be neat, right? So we know what schizophrenia is, then the network extracts it automatically. But uh, that's our input data, right? And when we look at the faces and the cars, our vision system that uh, was trained, in, you know, millions of years, helps us to recognize. Oh yeah, look, the network learns something useful because I can recognize. It. But when I look at the fMRI data, I don't even know if it's useful or if it's noise. At least I mean, I'm talking about myself. Uh, some radiologist probably can. Detect. So it's very hard to analyze if the network is learning anything or not. Is it useful or not? So we came up with, uh, uh, like back in 2013, we came up with this idea in uh, using uh, embedding the nonlinear dimensionality reduction to see if the network learns any useful things. 
And here's an example. Those are MNIST handwritten digits. If we take those digits and just represent them as vectors, no meaning, no digits. We know they are digits because we are looking at them and like, oh, this is a three, this is a nine, this is a zero. But they're just like zeros and ones. They are numbers for like, there are no classes. So there is this algorithm called uh, TSNI, uh, T distributed uh, stochastic linear embedding. If you give this data to this algorithm, it takes, say, that three and finds a two dimensional point on the plane somewhere. So each point here corresponds to one of the digits there. But TSNI doesn't know anything about digits. It just it, it knows there is a high dimensional data set, 700 and plus dimensions, and uh, it needs to put all of the 8,000 digits uh, in this plot into to D in such that the neighborhoods relation or the neighbors that are there in the high dimensional space are neighbors in this 2D. And if we put the colors of the digits, of course, everything or a lot of things make sense. Uh, similar digits uh, go together and dissimilar di digits go apart. So we take this approach and apply it to analyzing in vanilla network and learn anything useful. So this is a schizophrenia versus healthy control experiment uh, with a network with three layers, and our input is uh, structural uh, structural data uh, here. So if we apply, if we look at uh, raw data, if we try take the raw data and try to embed it into two-dimensional space, that's how it looks. And the color there is for schizophrenia and healthy controls, and there is there is hardly any any difference between those groups. And then if we take a shallow model, just level one model, then we sort of already see that uh, yellow and red, they, they start to differentiate, but they are not uh, differentiated as well. And in depth two, we see already, uh, I'm, I'm showing iterations here. So much more, like much larger differentiation. But in level three, where we actually got good, got good results, we see good differentiation so now even I don't understand what it learns, if it learns anything useful, but I know that it, it is learning separation. So that, that tells us. What is the input? What is the input? MRI. MRI. Structure MRI. MRI. Yeah, but is it cortical thickness or white matter? Gray matter. Blah, blah, blah? Concentration matters. Okay. I think there is no way to see, for example, uh, which, which of the uh, data it has used more, for example, which of them has uh, more impact on the learning? And the reason why there, there are methods we haven't, yeah, we haven't used them back then, so, and still, still even now, we, we haven't applied reliably any of these methods. Like in convolutional networks, you can, you can propagate back to the input layer, like the brain here, which part was the network paying attention. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, we, we haven't done that like that. But have, you know, uh, have you know how many layers you call? You don't. You cross call it. You play. Uh, it's art, basically. <laughs> well, we figured out that's the static version of that previous picture. Not good separation of raw data, neither for depth one. And with each depth, we get uh, better uh, separation. So when we were uh, doing that work, the the claim, deep learning was uh, claiming that, look, uh, depth is good because we get better abstractions, better separations with, with depth. But it was true for images. It wasn't true for brain images. We didn't know. So that the purpose of this work was to test if anything is happening like that, if we are getting good separation or not with depth. And apparently, there was something. But um, then we looked at uh, 3,500 brains, uh, some of them with Huntington disease, and uh, we've, we've done the same, but we only looked at the last layer of the network. And, okay, well, Huntington disease, uh, a little bit about it. Uh, it's a, a genetic disease that the person is born with. It's a cer certain, um, this CAG uh, gene is replicated multiple times. And after a certain threshold, you have the disease. The, the question is only when it will kick in. So like at birth, basically, they can diagnose with the disease. Like you, the label is known, the class. It's uh, what is not known is severe. It's like what, the age at, will it, at, at which it will start. And can we detect it as early as possible? 
So yeah, the uh, this CAC length is number of repeats combined with the age, and there is a CAP score. Uh, this CAP score, if it's low, basically t test of structural images between health controls and uh, Huntington disease patients don't show anything. That like there's, there are no differences. And then media, uh, you already see the differences, and high is. We see a severe decrease uh, in cognitive abilities and in, in uh, gray matter uh, structure, like here. This is Huntington's versus Huntington disease with high uh, score. So when we, uh, yeah, so we know what are the groups, right? We know uh, who has Huntington's disease because it's genetic, it's it's there, and we know who are healthy controls. But can we can we like? find out what, what anything that we don't know or can the network find out anything that we don't know oh your yeah interesting something about your chrome uh -huh. yeah the picture doesn't show <laughs> so can you explain the structure MRI right Structural, uh, gray matter concentration maps, actually. Uh, so are they not converting them? No, we actually never, well, uh, not never, I'll show you an example of involutional neural network. So, which point did you use? Uh, this is something about, let's try some part. Can you, how do you? Just feed forward neural networks, or basically with pre-training, uh, RGM pre-training, feed forward neural networks. That's worse. Oh, that's it. That's it. Yes. It's supposed to. Oh yeah, it works. Okay, something with Chrome. So the top layer of a network trained to recognize Huntington disease from healthy controls was embedded into the space by a nonlinear embedding method. And we see that the network kind of got them perfect, besides like maybe this guy, Carl, and those two. But uh, that's okay, uh, 3,500, that's just too many points there. But we didn't, the goal is not to get them perfect or not to predict them. The goal is to see were there any structure in the data that the network can uh, pick. So if we put age, there, there is already some structure, right? Like uh, you can say, okay, this, this end is lighter, this end is uh, darker. And here the same, this end is lighter, this end is darker. But not that much. Gender, the, the gender is like randomly placed uh, around this uh, structure. So the bottom one is a control, and the one is a... This is control, this is Huntington disease, yes, sorry, thank you. Uh, so there is this score cognitive decline, this is basically like an IQ test. And interesting, well of course, uh, controls, they didn't uh, put through this test, they only put the, the, the Huntington disease patients through this test. And you see that there is a spectrum here. The lighter patients are put here, but by this score, and the darker uh, with you know worse score are put on this end. And so remember this low, medium, and high score. That's kind of combination of this score, the cognitive decline um, is uh, with well, it's combination of age and disease severity uh, of how many repeats. So. If, here, the network chose to place them from low to high. So the network already saw that the information and the data, the whole network saw was uh, concentrate, gray matter concentration maps. That's it, not, nothing else. And from, from that, it, it saw the differences. And remember, people here on this end are indistinguishable by t-test with people here. Yes. Uh, from the, so that, that was uh, interesting and uh, so compared to optimal univariate statistics, do we see any any issue type showing with relationship with disease severity? Like for example, maybe the So univariate statistics doesn't show anything. Yeah, but for for low for low spectrum. 
but medium and high, yeah, there are differences which I showed. I can can we switch back to normal? I just love it more. And it's more abstract art. Yeah. You're an artist, right? That's what you said. At heart. Yeah. So okay, well, but the problem. Uh, I, I don't know, am I going too slow? No, you're fine. Uh, the problem with um, deep learning and neuroimaging is that we only have uh, very few subjects. Our data sets are huge, we have 60,000 voxels and uh, we have more high resolution. So what we figured out is that um, if we could generate synthetic data, then we could have as much data as we want. And synthetic data, say for example, um, we were inspired by what Google has done for street sign, street uh, house number recognition. Uh, they have a lot of uh, Google View images and they want to recognize the numbers of the houses right from there, not from another source of maps. So they train their network by, by pulling in a bunch of fonts and generating numbers and then transforming them via different angles and, and different lighting, different shading, and training the network on that. But that's easy. You understand the generative process. You know, okay, there will be a number, and it will be angled, and it will use some form. For brain imaging, we don't really know how to generate realistic brain images. And so basically what we've done, we took an ICA decomposition and uh, fixed this of uh, mixed group data, schizophrenia versus health control fixed the sources and started sampling, and that's our work, started sampling uh, mixing coefficients that are similar to group coefficients uh, of each group and generating more data. So with this approach, so uh, take our previous model, the three-layer model, uh, and if you try to classify raw data by using k-nearest numbers or you use k nearest neighbors on the top hidden layer. Uh, that that's what you get an improvement in uh, F1 score, schizophrenia versus healthy control. And if you pre-train by this synthetic data generation, then you get even better improvement. And that's true for um, whether you use linear SVM or log logistic regression at the top. So uh, the next step was let's take structural and functional data and build a fused model of structural and functional data and build a classifier. But instead of training on real data, structural and functional, let's train on generative data, just only on synthetic data. And on synthetic data only, with tests on the real data, we get, uh, those are different kind of uh, training, MVM or uh, something with rejection. We get better, best scores compared to any other uh, unimodal uh, trained data or, or any other methods applied to raw data. So then the next step that, oh wait. That's not, oops. Sorry, I was. Uh, it's not answering. Yep. No, it's not bootstrapping. It's uh, bootstrapping would be you just taking subsets of the data, yeah. but we're not taking subsets of the data. We're taking an ICA, take uh, ICA components, but the mixing matrix keeps keep changing and keep remixing the components for for different uh, data, data. So because you can keep remixing as much as you want indefinitely, you you can you can train as long as you want until it converges. But you're always training on synthetic data. So basically you have an infinite source of data and you just stop when you feel like it or okay, the model doesn't improve anymore. And then recent work that's what Noah has been doing is take the same model but instead of uh, fMRI uh, maps use uh, SNPs, SNP data. And here's, this is very, very preliminary result and th this is accuracy with an SMRI um, structural data. SNPs are very noisy, and when you join them, you get a slightly better result. But if you look at the embedding of this output layer, this is 
just as MRI, this is SNPs, no separation or poor separation. Uh, at least in the embedding, the model may be doing something else. That's why the model is slightly better than we can guess here. And this is combination, combined uh, use data. So the, the good thing about neural networks is that they're very flexible. Like in other signal processing and pattern recognition, to build a multi-model model, you need to think hard how to combine different modalities. What to. here you just you know you just keep stacking them. You go, uh, add one model and another model side by side, and use the same back propagation process, the same stochastic gradient descent, and um, uh, keep working with it. So uh, there is another model I mentioned at the beginning, which is just called recurrent neural network, and this is just briefly by Jules' work, where we took a model, translation model, that translates from one language to, to another, and um, with using recurrent uh, neural networks in the, in the layers here. But our languages were SMRI and um, FLC states through each subject goes. So this is actually closer not to translation, because the uh, translation is sequence to sequence. And this is more image captioning. So we, should, we have a static structure uh, and a, a dynamic string. Can we figure out how they relate? And uh, there is an attention mechanism here that actually shows relationship between anything in here and anything in there. And we found that in this attention mechanism, that, that, that's kind of an average attention of uh, thresholded attention map from states uh, to structural. Uh, we have five states in FNC, uh, and we have structural components here. And so, so, so why is uh, start from structural configurates to FNC? I would expect it if you're using structural connectivities, you know it can match well with the that here they make it more sense, like your input and your ending is the same, even though it's a different modality, but the same data, data formats. No, we don't need, uh, actually, we don't have any formats here. We're not even looking at the data. Think of it as indices. We, the input here is just indices of the spatial maps, and the output is state one, state two, state, state three. The order of the states matters. It's like take one subject, the states go in this order, and the structural maps have those weights. Like actually, actually we take weights here, and then take another subject, the states go in different order. So this co-correlation matters. It's how how one subject transitions from one state to another, versus uh, what kind of uh, spatial maps, spatial um, weights uh, of spatial maps. Uh, they have. And this model is not a feed forward model. This is a model that scans through the sequences back and forth. Uh, and I'm, uh, yeah, I, um, I'm simply simplifying things. And I only have one slide for this. I didn't want to go into, into the details. But so it's not just we take one data set, like images, and push it through. It's rather than we take a sequence and a right, sequence. But, but your, the bottom bottom row has still you know, has it's not entire, entire it's not entire right it's just the weight for this uh we, right. we run your pre, pre we run ICA on the spatial maps and we select uh, right. you uh have to the have a predefined area or a multiple area so that you can match with your your eventual FNC is that is that what you're doing? Uh so uh Procedurally, we take structural data of all the subjects, apply ICA, generate uh, structural components, and then those are the structural components. And each subject has the loadings, right? The weights, how those components combine into their specific structure. So we take those loadings for one subject, and then the, we take their FNC, uh, not an FNC transition uh, uh, time, time course. Like, why, why, why FNC? Why not just the MRI and the component? Uh, because that would be too much data. If we need a discrete alphabet. We need, we need, like, we need to put it closer to a language model where we have, we have a fixed number of states. So it's kind of like discrete alphabet and a discrete sequence. And here, 
there is a fixed number of states as well, just five, and so that uh, like words or letters. Uh, so we could just. So that's why we're seeing that. Uh, so pretty much similar. So instead of using using the SMI data on the ending point, like right? you know, you want to have you know uh, limit how you say constraints data size, right? So why don't you use the same structural Structural matrix, structural kind of data matrix, like math. So that because uh, we don't, we are not interested um, how structure relate to structure. We're interested in the question of structure relates to function. And our function is that transition from cognitive state to cognitive state, from F and C to F and C, is our function. So we have this up, this language, functional language, which we reduce down to transition. Uh, we cannot deal with like infinite time series or like continuous time series we uh, like because there, there is no language uh, there will be um, uh, close to infinite number of parameters how, how to predict the time series we took an already existing model that deals with language where here there is this language or a sentence say some utterance uh, represented in discrete terms right letters from an alphabet and then words from a dictionary. So we took our dictionary, one, two, three, four, five, and then a sequence here of how the transition. Yeah, we can't. We, we just can't handle raw fMRI. And then with raw fMRI, the question is hard. Here we know. Okay, at time point t, this subject was in state five. Okay, how does it relate to the, the fact that they have, uh, I don't know, Qtman weighted lowest in the whole uh, structural group that we use? So those kind of questions, this matrix can tell us that, look, this is attention how, like, when the network is doing this analysis, it pays high attention to state one and uh, temporal lobes. And, uh, like it doesn't pay attention here in the states versus those uh, uh, spatial components. So if we look at the groups, now we can plot those attention matrices on uh, for different groups, schizophrenia, healthy controls, and we see that attention is actually discriminated. For schizophrenia, it says different spatial parts are predictive of different temporal sequences. Not, not just F and C's, it doesn't know about F and C, it just knows one goes after two. Uh, like, well, it's it just the, the, the change schedule. Yeah, but it's, this paper is still in preparation. It's almost done, uh, some, some things, but by two, uh, yeah, it works remotely, it's not weak. I can give you the draft. Okay, okay. Yeah, I Sure, sure. It's, yeah, I mean, it's... Yes, of course, it's because I have the right case, the idea that, you know, you have the virus and you put the drugs and output, you know. No, 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 this is a totally different right? model, yeah. Yeah, it's like a switching, it's not like you were talking about. Yeah, now it's totally switched. This it's is like important. It's important understanding what is in between, how, you know, this, yeah, that's part of the Yeah, story. think about it like this model encodes the information about the brain into some representation. And this model decodes it in such a way that it can generate, oh, okay, now I know that they have those weights. What will the next state be? So this is actually two models combined, if you're thinking forward and backwards. And plus, there is a model here, that's the, the one I mentioned before, but I don't want to look at this, infinite length model, that is recurrent, that kind of uh, loops on itself. So it can track sequences, has memory. And uh, people claim it's a universal computer. It can compute any computable function. So like, yeah, and um, uh, people done some stuff. So uh, some uh, another uh, uh, step that we recently done as well. Uh, so convolution, right? You take that filter and you convolve through this image. Now you go to the next level, next layer, which I showed before. And usually you take another fil filter like that and convolve uh, with the next layer that was generated by this image. And if you think about it, is that uh, think of two layers put on top of each other without any reduction, without pulling. So then this point will see uh, a patch at the next level 
that is three by three. But but that patch itself show, sees the input that is also three by three. So there is like a larger uh, five by five field of view to each point at the next level. But then in order for the last uh, layer, no, no pooling, no reduction. It's just you keep stacking them. It's like a uh, like a block. So for the last layer to see the whole image, you need linear number of layers with with the rate of the increase of your field of view. So if you want, if you have say uh, I don't know how many there, are, uh, say you have ten pixels, so you need to have ten layers in order to see the whole image. If you have more, like 200 uh, pixels, then you need more and more. But in, if instead of just using the same filter, you use dilated filter, you only use every other points at each layer and every other. Or you can dilate them at any rate you want. Now, your expansion of field of view is not constrained by the depth of the network. You're not, you now can control it. And so you get fewer number of parameters and a network that can be sees at all resolutions. Like this one sees blurry, this one sees uh, uh, very well. So what we've done, we, we built a network like that and applied it to structural images where our labels, our training data was segmentation labels from FreeSorper. So our segmentation data was not generated by human, but it was generated by FreeSorper. And also, we didn't take all of the possible labels uh, that FreeSurfer could have given, uh, given us, as it turned out. And we uh, we learned uh, that our network learned something that FreeSurfer didn't teach it. So it did learn uh, to classify, to segment images quite well. So basically, you take as an input your raw MRI, uh, just just an MRI image, unprocessed. Uh, you don't apply any sharpening, any filtering. And in 30 seconds, you have an output labeling for each of the voxels. What do they belong to uh, out of the brain, gray matter, or white matter? And sometimes our labelings are better than free surfer ground rules that we trained it on. Uh, like here, corpus callosum, and free surfer didn't give us corpus callosum because we didn't include it, as it turned out. But uh, the network learns something more than it was uh, taught. And sometimes we make mistakes, uh, like here, like two, two sparse separations, sometimes we get the, like the bonds, but uh, those are can be the mistakes. Mostly can be removed by post processing. But the thing is, now in in under a minute, we can segment the brain in the subject space without any transformation for any brains, and then we can take multimodal data of T1, T1 IR, and flare, put it all together, and learn the segmentation as well. So. That, that's the recent result that we got, which has been accepted. So, uh, I think because TY images doesn't really, I mean, they are pretty much equal, I mean, in terms of anatomy. What I would be interested in say, going to other modalities, like, can they handle, say, do they have, like, very bad distortion? Like, if you walk pretty good onto the cortical region, then Well, if you've got training data, if you can manually label it, say, or if, if you have already labeled data that is stretched or changed, then we can train this model data. This training actually doesn't require that much data. It, it uh, can be trained on three subjects or four subjects. Maybe, yeah, we can try. But basically, the way it works is more so free server goes layer by layer and then stitches them all together. The, uh, this network looks in the context of the 3D context. And so that, that is helpful because you know, okay, well now you're at the front of the brain and then uh, unlikely there will be gray matter there. Or you're in the back, then there must be some gray matter, things like that. So it, it sees the context. It's more, it's not context three, it has a larger uh, volumetric context. Uh, yes, yeah, so some of the, uh, so there are other models, open questions, right? 
for simulator, right now our simulator is very primitive. It's ICA and uh, just linear mixture of components with different weighting. But there are generative adversarial networks or adversarial other encoders, models that can generate very good images or very good, like an MNIST data that handwritten digits handles really well. It can keep generating realistically looking data. Can we train those models to generate fMRI or MRI data that is realistic and also has some group information uh, hidden there because those models they learn um, distribution of the data and then uh, we call this network uh, that does this mesh map so can we generate surfaces directly instead of segmentation can we go end to end can we train and take pre server data the triangulation of the surfaces can we just generate directly from MRI give us the triangulation in a minute or so. That'd be nice because then we get a 3D model that we can use uh, in, other, in other places. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is a normal question if you want to hack it. And uh, then the, uh, the question, yeah, like, we, we still haven't gotten there. How to visualize what, what parts of the brain may led to this decision or not. So that, that you can work on it. That'd be interesting. I don't know if anyone has that. And uh, then another one is genetic data. In your picture, Christopher parcel every, for example, 100 parts of the gray matter, right? Does the model parcel it, parcel it with different, of every different, collapse every different segment? I don't understand. It has not been tried. It was just trying with gray and white matter segmentation. It was not trying with all the sub population of your only uh, work for uh, gray matter and white matter because like no, no, no. So it, for now it hasn't tried only with gray matter and white matter. But if we try it with all the layers yeah. of individual regions, then it might have. We didn't. Have we didn't give it the task to learn different regions. So only with, so only with white matter and gray matter, right? And non-brain. That's how we trained it. If you think different output data and train it on different output data, then uh, the answer will be different. Then it can. But we haven't tested it. Yeah, you need to just learn, teach it with different colors now. Like instead of those three labels, non-brain, white matter, and gray matter, train it on the... Uh, I, I was wondering because I had a problem then because after you have a like probably the all base with post-processing, because, in, for example, in uh, some part of the brain, for example, uh, in lower ACC and something like that, it, it can't find the boundary between gray matter and white matter correctly. So, what we used, or what we always did, was uh, actually by hand actually yeah. say that so this point is very, we actually teach it that this point is white matter. But white by matter. eye, you can see that. The, yeah, but my question is that. Does this uh, algorithm actually find those problems? For example, find the problem that uh, right now uh, we are doing in the eye. It, it, it actually train Christopher more to say so according to our knowledge here in white matter. So we done your analysis and do your analysis again. So if you have this training data that human human have uh, labeled, not like you 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 corrected free server, right? And you have this data. We can train it on your label, the human label, and it will be very, very close to the human label. Like right now, we didn't have the human labeling. Because we separately uh, trained with uh, human label data, uh, they have used uh, their own atlases and labeled all of them, all of them, and then they use those atlases for new data. So whenever we are, uh, whenever the analysis is not, it's not that we have error, so we. Say, uh, say that pre-done. I think training again a little more. You call training, but actually it's processing. So you're not training pre-surfer. Uh, it, 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 uh, it uses different algorithms. It's just a processing algorithm. You're, say, you're sending one bar points and control points and rerunning those algorithms to detect better, uh, to better detect gray matter and white matter and so on and so forth. If you give me this data, and we train our model with this data as, okay, here's the input, here's how the output should look like. And this is certified, it's corrected by a human. Then it will learn with pretty good accuracy to 
replicate the human. Here, we didn't have any human data. It's just whatever free server generated. And this is human connectome project. So I don't know, maybe they've done this manual correction that you're talking about, or they haven't. But the point is that it learns better than it was taught. So there are two things mixing here. One is, you're asking, can it learn what I teach it? And the answer is yes. Like, if you can see by eye, it basically the model looks similarly. Like, whatever you can see by eye, it, it's, uh, it kind of imitates it. Not perfectly, but that's how it functions. Unlike Free Surfer, it's not looking quote unquote. It, it applies different mathematical algorithms, level sets, and so on and so forth. And this model is replicating this vision process when you're scanning and so on and so forth. As I showed the convolutional neural network. This is a convolutional neural network of a specific kind. Uh, then another question is, what if my data, my ground truth is wrong? Or is, uh, if it's systematically wrong, that's bad, right? But if it's like, what if it's uh, wrong randomly? Then, as this shows, uh, here. Yeah, like look, free surfer teaches it that there is no gray matter, and there is, and it detects it. Even though free, this is ground truth, this is what free surfer, free surfer was teaching this uh, person, uh, this model. Well, actually, this is training data, uh, testing data. So the model never saw it, but Free Surfer doesn't show gray matter there, and the model still detects it. Free Surfer doesn't show corpus callosum there, and the model still sees that. But this is different from your question, all the related. So if you teach it on the data that Free Surfer generated, for example, I, I was wondering if does it work like this in the per just per subject, the uh, sub the ground truth of Free Surfer, and that they have a subject in there that they actually validated that? I don't know. Uh, so you, do you have a, do you have a T1 image of this subject? Yeah, it is on the uh, free server subject. It is on the free server folder. It, it is included in free server. Yeah, the subject name there, if I remember correctly. Yeah, we can easily run and generate the segmentation. But this is all data from human kind of project. Yeah, so I think he's saying that he, he, free server also gives even more refined labeling for different structures in the different elements. No, no, this is now a different question. Okay. Is the question now is about resolver makes mistakes sometimes, okay. and they have like a testing validation subject. Oh, but uh, yeah, something that they manually fixed, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Because uh, I always thought that because resolver is actually meant for it is that they have trained resolver as I said. I, I'm not sure if it's a good idea to, uh, for example, use the output of the uh, machine learning, learning algorithm and then try another machine learning algorithm on that output to see if it, if, if it could start. Uh, if it, uh, well, that's the point that we learn something more than, uh, than it, it teaches because the teacher is randomly wrong every time. And so the system figures out the, the, the pattern. Like sometimes you're wrong, but well, it's not like you're consistently saying that red is black. Sometimes you're saying red is black. Sometimes you're saying, oh, yellow is green. But when, when you go, oh, no, they, they made a mistake. So you, you just ignore that. Thing. So the model ignores that they run this input and learns to recognize them, which is good because we, we very rarely have human training data. It's like to label all by human is very hard. So now the claim here is, and I can send you the paper. It's on our file, uh, by the way. Yeah. Uh, the claim here is that we can train on imperfect labeling and still be better than the teacher. Okay. Yeah, it's too late. That's better than that. Yeah. The algorithm is better than the teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, that, that, then the hope is that we can bootstrap. We can invent the next algorithm and train it on the, on the, on the student okay. and so on and so forth. Yeah. Then they will be a, yeah, keep improving. The you said the mistake should be not systematic. Yeah, yeah, if the mistake is systematic, then it's like it will be picked yeah. up as a ground. Yeah, handle a small variation. Yeah. Like but nothing can handle systematic mistakes. Yeah. Right? Because you trust your teacher. Yeah, you yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I can send me an email and I'll send it. It's an archive, Google and archive. Alex uh, is the person. Ishwar, 
it's Ishmael or me and Alex are there and other people. But the, the question, that's the last question that no one is working on now, is how to handle genetic data, how to handle SNPs data. We have like a long strand of uh, SNPs, millions, and we have only a few subjects, right? And here, if we go as traditional way, enter one subject, train, enter another train, so we have, uh, uh, we don't have enough samples in the data set to, to justify all of the parameters. We have, we need to have million time, millions times number of hidden units of parameters if we use feed forward network. And that's too much. When we need, basically we need like billions of subjects, which we don't have. So that, so there are three ideas. Uh, one idea is to use convolutional neural network and represent a SNP sequence as a picture. It's kind of a very, ba like a banded picture, three by millions, but you can scan through it. That's one way. Uh, and an another one, the, the problem there is what is the label? What is the training signal? Uh, because if your label is disease, so you have uh, a sample that is millions of SNPs long, and there is only one label, so it's hard to train. But with recurrent neural network, which no one has done, but that's very interesting to do, we could train the recurrent neural network at predicting next SNP. Then we have millions and millions of samples to train on. We, 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 it's like as soon as the neural network understands the structure of SNPs that is able by previous history to predict what the next SNP will be, then we can, we, it's already basically trained. Then we can say, okay, now uh, let's train you to predict the, the disease from this versus that. So there are three approaches. One approach that Devon was trying but that didn't go anywhere uh, because of the lack of time. We can split chrom uh, SNPs into chromosomes and train them separately like in multimodal learning. Uh, another one is CNN, but CNN has, it's more powerful, but has the same problem of what is the training signal? Uh, how many subjects do we need? That's it. Yeah, if you hack on any of those, or on any of those, that'd be good. Yeah, that'd be good. Uh, it's unsolved problems. So can you use the same ability for the synthetic data?